DiscerningHearts.com presents Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors. I'm your host, Chris McGregor, and I am delighted to be joined by Thomas Jacoby, who is an assistant editor at Ignatius Press. He studied literature and language at Louisiana State University and at La Sapienza in Rome. With Thomas Jacoby, we go inside the pages of Father Antonio Maria Sicri's How Saints Die, 100 Stories of Hope, published by Ignatius Press. Italian Carmelite Antonio Maria Sicri's vibrant biographies of saints, from Augustine to Catherine of Siena to Faustina Kowalska, have been read across Europe for decades. In How Saints Die, Father Sicri turns to the most difficult challenge of the life of a Christian, the hour of death. What he uncovers in the darkest moment, however, is not desolation, but inexplicable joy. We now begin our conversation with Thomas Jacoby. Thomas, thank you so much for joining me. Chris, I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me. What an interesting name for a book, How Saints Die, A Hundred Stories of Hope. This is absolutely fabulous. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. I was thrilled when this book uh, came across my desk. In fact, I've been reading Father Sicari for years. In Italian, uh, he's been writing these he's been writing these little short biographies of saints um, that he calls portraits of saints uh, for many years, these little collections of biographies of saints. And uh, they've never been translated before into English. I've loved them. And this is the first book of his that's been translated into English. So I'm, I'm thrilled to bring it up. People may be... I don't want to say put off by the title, but I guess that's what could happen when they see how saints die. They might think, well, this would be kind of depressing or kind of heavy. But actually, it is, I think, transformative. And in some way, in a very deep level, if we're honest, maybe we're afraid of death, aren't we? And, and even looking at how other people die or their stories, that is something that I think is more based in fear. What do you think? Well, in fact, Father Sikari, he, um, he begins this book with a little preface. And he says in this preface that a friend of his saw the manuscript, finished manuscript of this book on the living room table at his house. And he, he saw the, the title, How Saints Die. He just kind of balked. He said, I want to be a little gloomy to read. How Saints Die, you know? And he goes on to reflect about it. And he says that, in fact... Uh, it is the opposite of gloomy. It's anything but gloomy. And he says that, in fact, in the death of a saint, it is death that dies. You know, this is actually about conquering death in a sense. And he quotes uh, St. Teresa of Avila, who he says already as a little girl, had this tremulous desire. He says, I want to see God. And that's what death is. That's passing over into eternity, passing over into the arms of God. And if you understand death in that way, Death is, uh, in fact, a great gift. It is, it is possibly, it is a, a total surrender to God's loving embrace, you know, and that's what this book is about, how each saint surrenders in a, in a unique way to God's loving embrace. You know. It affected, ultimately, how they live and how they embrace life to such an extent that they became shining lights for others around them. And isn't that what we're called in the, this universal call to holiness? Yes. And in fact, there's a, there's a wonderful quote from a saint, a blessed, I had never heard of before in my life uh, until this book. His name is Vladimir Gika. He was a Romanian prince, actually, Catholic prince. And he was imprisoned in a communist, uh, a communist prison camp in the, the 50s. And uh, the conditions were pretty brutal. It was almost like a concentration camp. And he, he spent the last of his days actually entertaining his fellow prisoners with stories from his very exciting life that he had as a, as a diplomat and as a prince, you know, this Romanian prince. And he would just tell these great, these really entertaining, lively, joyful, edifying stories. And he was a very devoted Christian as well. So he saw things through this lens and he died with, he died with this sense of um, great joy and helping others to share in that joy. And he, there's a quote from him that he said sort of prophetically, uh, in the last years of his life, he said that our death must be the supreme act of our life. 
but it may happen that God is the only one who knows about it. And I said all that, I, I went off on that tangent there because um, this idea that death is the supreme act of our life um, is, is really what drives Father Sicuri's whole project in this book of zooming in on, on just the moment of death uh, in saints' lives. It's just a, a page, these little biographies that he has in this book, it's just a page, two pages max. And he uses that little space to zoom in on this one tiny little moment in a person's life. Um, but in that tiny little moment, you really see the entire person pass before your eyes, the way this, this person lived in the presence of God, the way this whole, the saint's whole mission, the saint's whole personality. You really see it all in the way that this person uh, faces death. I think that's such uh, an incredible insight. We have just lived through a particular period collectively, I would not just say in the United States, but throughout the entire world, where death and the fear of death has struck us all so deeply to that core. What do you believe? How will you embrace life as it is right now? And how do you look at the fear of the, the possibility of losing your life? How do you want to witness that? I think that's really key here. Many in the church, when we reflect on the last things, we don't do that often, do we, Thomas? No, I think that I spend most of my time, unfortunately, trying to forget <laughs> that I am mortal. Uh, but in fact, what that leads to, oddly enough, paradoxically enough, I think that Father Secretly would agree with me here that the whole book is about this, that by trying to forget that we are mortal, um, we we actually wind up forgetting that we are eternal, that we are made for eternity. And his introduction to the book, he says um, that in life we we're faced with two re- we're faced with two uh, huge realities. The first of them, the primary, is love. And love, he says, which we receive um, from our parents. At least ideally, we receive from our parents or at least some kind of parental figure, you know. I mean, uh, but then there's we receive love from the church for Christian. But love, he says, love is that what love is, love is this force that uh that tells you this is for for, for lack of a better definition, he 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 uses the, the definition of Gabriel Marcel, the French philosopher. Love says to the beloved, you will never die. You will never die because you are eternal. You're made for eternity. He says, that's one reality we experience in this life is this force that says to us, you know, I want to preserve your life at all costs because you are made for eternity. You're made to never die. You're made to live forever. But then we experience the other reality of suffering, you know, and pain. And then eventually what seems to be uh, disappearing, you know, separation, departure. And he says that these seem to be in conflict. Like, how can love make a promise it can't keep? Because we, we do die. We, uh, it, it seems to be that love lied to us. But in reality, he says that in Christ, Christ reveals to us that no, love is absolutely keeping the promise. You shall never die because Christ conquers death. You know, Christ conquers death through the resurrection. But suffering without negating the suffering, you know, so that he, Father Sikori says that suffering poses a question to us. It, it asks us, it makes us ask ourselves, who am I, you know, um, which we, we really don't, even psychologists say this, we really don't ask, we don't really don't become self-aware. We don't start ask. we don't start becoming aware of our surroundings and the fact that we're individuals until we begin to kind of experience some pain and kind of separate, set some separation from our parents embrace a little bit. We kind of, we kind of stand on our own and we begin to suffer a little bit. Uh, and that deepens more and more as life goes on. But Christ unifies uh, this, the promise of love. You are made for eternity. You shall never die. And the reality of suffering. Um, so I, uh, yeah, and the saints, they prove, they prove that they prove the reality of this because they were able to die with such great, they all die in unique ways, but they die with such great joy. That's really the one, that's one, that's the only real pattern. <laughs> that's one of the few patterns that you notice is uh, they die with great joy and with great tender love for the God that they are coming to embrace, a God they know very personally. And they're excited to meet him because they know they're going to, they're going to, 
they're going to have an intimacy with him that they they couldn't have in this in this fallen world. Yeah, that's the the great paradox that even in their suffering, there is joy. And I think you can be said that joy and happiness are, are different things in a real way. The type of suffering they may have endured during death, for example, Therese the Little Flower, is one. Her suffering was great and the pain, and I doubt that she was happy. But the joy that uniting herself with the suffering Christ and the knowledge of what awaited her that grace, that beacon, has become one that the entire world has seen for generations now. And it does provide that hope, that hope, the hundred stories of hope. And I think we need more hope, don't we? Certainly. Yeah, we certainly need more hope. We need more love and we need more hope. And, you know, I think th- there's some there's some beautiful illustrations of uh, of what I mean, you just gave the great illustration of St. Therese, whose death is, uh, that's one for the, that's definitely one for the books. That's one that everybody, mm-hmm. everybody should learn more about the, the death of St. Therese because she, she suffered so much in her, in the months before leading up to her death, not only physically, but really psychologically, I would say as well, if not spiritually, because she even, she was even tempted with, I mean, she had to bear the, she had to really bear the cross. I mean, she was tempted even with atheism, you know, mm-hmm. atheism and kind of suicidal thoughts and, uh, I know at least Elizabeth of the Trinity too was, was tempted with suicidal thoughts, you know, in, in her suffering and, and um, the agony is, is unbearable, but yet there's this light that suffuses even that. And so you, you see this, you see this light entering into the darkness of suffering over and over again. And the, and the deaths of these saints and even saints who die, totally alone, like St. Peter Claver, for example, mm-hmm. the Jesuit missionary. He went to Colombia to minister to the slaves there. Slavery, I mean, the, the new world was very new at that time. This is the beginning of, this is the end of the 16th century. Um, he's going to, to minister to the slaves who don't know Christ, you know, and who are being treated uh, abysmally. Obviously, they're seen as property. And he goes to minister to them. He bet, you know, he spends his whole life there 40 years. He gives his life over to, to, the, to the care physical and spiritual of these people, these enslaved people. But in his last hours, you know, his last months, he's, he's dying pretty much alone in a cell, despite all the care that he had given to, to these people, he, he winds up dying alone. There's no one there to care for him, but he had great joy in that because he knew that he knew that the seed has to die in the soil in order to bear fruit. And he knew that Christ too was, was his, his beloved, had died alone on the cross, you know, abandoned and mocked. And he had, his last days were, were filled with great gratitude and love. And then the moment that he died, even though he'd been totally alone, all these months as he was, as he was fading out, all of a sudden the people, the, 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 the people, his people, the, the slaves he had cared for, they heard about, they heard that the saint had died. Peter Clay, Father Peter had died. And they rushed over to the cloister where he was staying. And they basically broke down the gates in order to go and just be by the court, the body of this saint to, t- to touch the body of this holy man, to pray with him, to pray for him, you know, to, to just bask in that light that, uh, of, of this, this man who had given his life totally to Christ, you know? And so you, you see this, that even the saints, even when they die, kind of agonizing deaths that seemed ugly and might seem ugly from uh, without the eyes of faith. Um, the moment that they die, all of a sudden you see the fruit, you know, you see, you see the glory of it. And God gives us these signs in order to, to remind us that um, the death is not oblivion. Actually, it's the opposite of oblivion. It's eternity. It's eternal, you know, it's eternal fullness. So. We'll return to Inside the Pages in just a moment. This is Chris McGregor of Discerning Hearts, a nonprofit Catholic apostolate dedicated to evangelization and spiritual formation through the use of new media. Discerning Hearts creates engaging multimedia specializing in audio and video productions which are faithful to the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church and its rich, authentic spiritual tradition. Its mission responds to the Church's call to use the media for evangelization, catechesis, and spiritual renewal. We have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truth shared through Discerning Hearts totally free to users throughout the world. 
Besides our website, DiscerningHearts.com, Discerning Hearts has a newly updated free app where users can find all their favorite Discerning Hearts programming, including Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Deacon James Keating, Mike Aquilina, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, and so many more. There, too, you'll find numerous beautifully produced devotionals and novenas, including the Holy Rosary and Stations of the Cross, to help users create a sacred time for prayer wherever they may be. Discerning Hearts programming can be found on numerous streaming platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and so many more. Discerning Hearts also has an ever-growing YouTube channel. Discerning Hearts online spiritual retreats and seminars have helped souls in North and South America, Europe, Africa, Australia, the Middle East, and the Philippines. For many people all around the world, Discerning Hearts is a daily source of inspiration, spiritual nourishment, and encouragement. We can only do this thanks to the generous financial support of our friends and benefactors. Please consider donating to our mission today. The world is looking for answers, for spiritual guidance and authentic discernment, for relationship and community. Your support is very much needed and appreciated. Please keep our mission in your prayers and tell a friend about Discerning Hearts. We now return to Inside the Pages. We're talking with Thomas Jacoby about the book How Saints Die, 100 Stories of Hope, published by wonderful Ignatius Press. And the thing that I loved about this book in so many ways, Thomas, was, you know, when we talked about suffering, and for Catholics in particular, it is something that is ever-present before us when we gaze upon a crucifix. It has been said that if you want to know how much Christ loves us, just gaze at a crucifix. Many of us, we want to unite our suffering to that passion of Christ, but we're not sure, you know, sometimes what we're going through. I don't know if I could do what he did upon that tree. I don't know if I could give that. But in this book, you see a hundred different ways in so many different lives, through so many different time periods, just how they too This is their passion. This is their moment on the cross. And yet, it all has a significant value. There's a beauty to it. And if it's that way for them, is it possible that that could be the way for me too? Does that make sense? It does. It makes perfect sense. Um, I take great consolation in particular. So this book is divided up into different sections. Mm -hmm. There are 100 stories of saints. Uh, you have and that are divided up into eight loose groups. He, Father Sigrid says that they're actually they're loose and they're they're not exact. Um, the first group is martyrs dying as martyrs. The second group um, is people who die of love, basically uh, like Saint Francis of Assisi, Saint Faustina, who die out of this sort of eros for their beloved Jesus. You know, then people who die of ecclesial passion, people who die out of uh, who kind of embody the church and die in that way. And then there are different, there are various groups, people who die as die of apostolic toil, people who die as mothers, people who die as fathers, um, or, you know, in a, in a, in an analogous sense, you know, like fathers in the church, mothers in the church. And then there, the last section is people who says they're, they're all lay people. The, 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 the section is called dying as saints. And I love this section. They're all lay people, mothers, fathers, husbands, wives, some of them consecrated lay people. Um, and they die in ways that are sort of, they're pretty much ordinary. <laughs> they seem pretty much ordinary. They're extraordinary. If you have the eyes of faith, they're extraordinary. They're extraordinarily beautiful, but in a simple way. And I take great consolation, for example, in the story of Madeline Delbrell, who was a, she was a French lay woman. She was a social worker. She lived in the suburbs of the outskirts of Paris, suburbs of Paris in a, in a communist town, actually. Um, and this is the early 20th century. She died in 1964. And her whole, her whole mission is really about just being a, per, a, a regular lay woman among regular people. A lot, most of the people she was around were total atheists, you know, and just being the leaven in the dough, you know, radiating, uh, giving, giving, giving a lightness, giving the lightness and joy 
of, uh, of the gospel to these people around her who didn't have any, who had no exposure to it, you know, and doing it in a quiet, ordinary sort of way um, in a way that they could, because they weren't going to accept the gospel if she just preached to them directly, you know, she had to do it sort of underground, but I take great consolation in her story because uh, as father Sikari says that she was, she was 60 years old. Um, and even at six, even at 60, she was, so she was already exhausted from her work. But even though she was exhausted, she still found the thought of death, he says, really repugnant. Um, she says, even kind of mocking herself, she says, eh, probably I was baptized only halfway. She's like, man, how, why am I afraid of death? You know, I thought that I was, I thought I was a Christian. And she wasn't really afraid, but she, she thought it, she thought it was repugnant. She didn't like the idea of death. And, um, and, but she says that she consoled herself because she recognized that Jesus too wept at the tomb of Lazarus. You know, Jesus wasn't excited about death and he also wept the agony in the garden. He also wept tears of blood, you know? So there is, it's okay to be, to feel awkward about death, you know, but the way that she, the way that she dealt with this repugnance she had, because she knew that that wasn't, that couldn't have the last word because she knew death was actually something glorious because Christ Christ died and Christ rose from the tomb. God himself died and rose from the, and then rose from the grave. Um, she wrote this little poem in the last years of her life that I think really summarizes what, like, what ordinary people like us who don't, feel, who don't have the kind of heroic approach to death that some of these saints have. This is the way that we can approach it. She says, I want what you want. She's talking to God. I want what you want without asking myself whether I have the capacity, without asking myself whether I have the desire without asking myself whether I want it. And so she's, she gives up her whole, she's letting go even of her desire. She knows she has this desire to live and, and not to die. Of course, it's, it's totally normal, but she knows that she's made for something more and she's going and she knows that she has to trust in God in a way that even goes against her instincts. You know, so she writes this poem and says, God, I want you, whether or not I really, whether or not I want it now, I know I want you. And I think that that that's really encouraging for me because I too I too am ner- I'm kind of nervous about death. You know, even I'm you know, 31, but I still have COVID and everything, and then people in my family dying. You know, I'm, I'm nervous about death. Uh, I know I shouldn't be in a sense because of the testimony of the saints. But someone like Madeline Delbrell, who she too felt nervous about it. A saint too can feel nervous. She's a servant of God. She's not canonized yet, but even in that nervousness, you can abandon everything to the Lord and find great consolation in that. And, you know, that is really the, that's, that's the Christian gesture, just total abandonment, total trust to to the Lord, the good loving Lord. I think you bring up a really good point, Thomas, because the thing is, none of these stories say that we shouldn't be fearful of death. There's a reason why certain types of fears are a good thing, you know, like touching a stove. We're fearful of having to touch the stove because we've experienced it's hot and it's not something we're supposed to do. Many of these saints, even though the moment of death or where their destiny lies, that's something they're assured. They're carried through grace through the moment into that, and it bears a great witness to all of us. There is that sense that I am supposed to be here to accomplish, to do something, to, you know, the mission of loving, and that whatever form that is supposed to do. And so they never feel it, they have enough time. There's yeah. more that I need to do. There's something I have to do. But then there's the ultimately the surrender to, but not my will, his will. And his will is greater and more beautiful than anything that I could will. Again, none of these saints, you look at their lives, there is that struggle, especially towards the end. I haven't finished everything yeah. that I'm supposed to do yet. Yeah, And yet there is the great mystery, letting go and letting God take that. And I think that's an important lesson for us too, isn't it? Yes. I mean, one of the, uh, some of the saint stories I like best in this book are the ones um, where the, the saint sort of throws up his hands at the end, you know, like here we have a uh, Jose Maria Escriva, who is uh, obviously, you know, he was the founder of Opus Dei says that there's a quote from him in the last years of his life, actually the last month of his life, 19, 1975, he, uh, he had just celebrated the 50th anniversary of the priesthood, you know? And uh, he says, 50 years have gone by and I am still like a faltering child. I'm just beginning. 
beginning again as I do each day in my interior life. And it will be so to the end of my days, always beginning again. Um, this, this is a notion that's actually really important for Adrian von Speyer as well. This notion that beginning constantly, you're always in the beginning, you're constantly beginning again. You know, Jesus saying in, in the revela revelation says, behold, I make all things new. This is true. This is true of heaven, but heaven's been brought down to earth, you know, in the, in the incarnation, you know, and uh, in the Eucharist. And the, uh, so we are able to live each, we can live each day. Like it's a, like it's a new beginning. We're always beginning again, but that, that requires humility, you know, at a certain point, just being like, you know, that's the humility of confession for one, you know, admitting our sins and being absolved. Um, but having, having the humility to begin again, um, like a little child, you know, like so you screw, you screw something up. You got to start from scratch. Um, learning to find joy in that, you know, and I take great consolation that some of the saints, uh, they were really, they were, they were really, even to their last days, they had this attitude of like feeling like they didn't really have it all figured out. They had to start over and over again. Like St. Dominic, for example, I love the story of St. The way St. Dominic does. It's so, it's kind of adorable. I don't know how else to put it. I mean, that's the only word I could think of, but he, uh, so he's on his deathbed. He's like lying on a some super cheap cot, you know, and he's like just wearing rags and it's super cold, I'm sure. And, you know, uh, very, mendicant. Dying in total, very, very mendicant. mendicant. Yeah. yeah. Very dying in total poverty. And he, uh, he's, he's got his, his brother Dominicans. He's found, he's obviously founded the Dominican order and he has his brother friars around him, his, who are his sons, really I mean, his spiritual children. And they're watching him in his death, his, the throes of death. And he, he kind of calls them closer and he says, uh, and he says, sons, I have a, I have something to tell you. I have not succeeded in avoiding the imperfection of feeling more attraction in conversing with young women than with those of advanced age, you know? So he had this kind of this sort of natural, he just sort of had this sort of natural inclination, you know, like sort of attraction to like, you know, pretty young women. Uh, he liked conversing with them more than with more than with older women. And he wanted to tell them this on his deathbed so that they knew like, look, I too <laughs> am screwing up all the time. I'm imperfect. I still have to grow. I'm like a little child. You need to know this about me. And I love that he died that way because we can think of this, the deaths of the saints as like being these glory, you know, the legendary stories from the, from, which I think are probably true from, from the, uh, from the early Christians in the middle ages, like the, the, the room is full of light, you know, and there are these miracles left and right at the death of a saint and the, the glowing face and all this. And that's, that's beautiful, but that can be intimidating, you know, like, phew. I gonna die like that? I, I know myself better than that. Mm -hmm. But somebody like Saint Dominic just confessing, "I am a normal guy in a certain sense. Like, I too am a sinner. You need to know this about me. I'm not some superhero. I'm not Superman." And that's a radical Christian gesture, way more than just being tough or playing the saint in the false sense of the word. You know, just like this, like playing the angel when really you're a human being. You know, uh, I like that attitude a lot. You know what I don't like is the fact that we're running out of time. Because I could talk to you continuously about this book. I mean, every story is a gem. But then that's the beauty of having it compiled. You know, this would be just one of those wonderful things where if you were to pick up a copy of this book, Thomas, and then each day, just take one. They're smaller, maybe a page and a half of a story, maybe two. To take that in first thing in the morning or even at night and just get to know that saint and to pray with them to learn their story. And who knows, you may be beginning a great friendship with those holy souls that are there to help us in all phases of our life and even through our death. It's a great book. Any final thoughts? I love, I love what you just said about this book being possibly kind of like a, a companion to us in our day-to-day -day life, you know, because there's, they're, like you said, they're so short, these little, bio, these little bios. And what I'll say is that it's amazing how close you can become to these saints, how intimately you can come to know these saints in just such a short, in a short text, because like we were saying in this interview, the, the moment of death, it, 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 we bring everything to the table, everything, everything's laid bare. 
And we see this in the lives of the saints in, in, in this moment of death that really every like their whole their whole self is laid bare. And we really see them at the, in this super vulnerable moment. And they really give everything over, not only to, to the Lord, but really to the church, to, to us in their deaths. You know, we, we're participating in, the, in this, the communion of saints, the treasury, the treasury of the church. You know, I think this book is so useful because it gives us a really kind of simple, accessible way to get to know these to get to know these these people who are, for Father Sicuri, he's made his life's work to, to write these little bios of saints. And it's not because saints are important historical figures like, I don't know, Martin Luther King or Alexander the Great, nor are they just good, good examples, you know, people we need to imitate. But they're a revelation, a unique revelation. Each saint is a unique revelation, actually, of, of the personality of God, in Christ. You know, each saint is so different. And each saint reveals something new that we didn't, we couldn't see before about Christ, about God. And that's why it's so important to get to know the saints. They, they reveal to us who God is in a fresh in a fresh and exciting way. So I would, uh, I would encourage people to, to pick up this book for that reason. And I also, you know, I want to encourage people because it is written by Father Sikri, who is a wonderful Carmelite spiritual master and who has written so many books over the years. Hearing him tell the tale made it even more wonderful in the experience of it all. I hope that we'll be able to experience more of his work in the future. Me too. Thomas Jacoby, thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. It's been fantastic. With Thomas Jacoby, we've gone inside the pages of Father Antonio Maria Sicuri's How Saints Die, 100 Stories of Hope. To learn more about this book or to obtain a copy, go to ignatius.com, the website for its publisher, Ignatius Press, or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com, or you can find it in the free Discerning Hearts app. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax deductible to help support our efforts. But most of all, we pray that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com and join us next time for Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors.